Welcome back to the first chapter of U.S. History 2 on History for Today. Now I'd like to talk about the labor movement. The ideas of social Darwinism attracted very little support, as you might imagine, from the mass of American industrial workers. Although at the turn of the 20th century, farmers were still actually the largest workforce in America, there was a growing number of industrial workers toiling in difficult jobs for very little pay for long hours. Mechanization and mass production threw skilled craftsmen into unskilled machine operator positions, and industrial work actually was very unstable. It ebbed and flowed with the economy, which government and big business had really failed to prevent from falling into cyclical recessions. The typical industrial worker could expect to be unemployed one month out of the year from furloughs or layoffs. They worked 60 hours per week, but they could still expect their total annual income to fall far below the poverty line. Among the working poor, wives and children were usually forced into the labor market to compensate. Crowded cities, meanwhile, failed to accommodate growing urban populations with decent housing and skyrocketing rents trapped families in overcrowded tenements. Strikes challenged American industry throughout the late 19th century and the early 20th. Workers seeking higher wages, shorter hours, and safer working conditions had struck throughout American history, even in the antebellum era, but organized unions were generally fleeting. The Civil War and Reconstruction seemed to briefly distract America from the plight of labor. But the failure of the Great Railroad Strike in 1877 convinced workers of the need to organize. Union membership began to climb. The Knights of Labor enjoyed considerable success in the early 1880s, due partly to its efforts to unite skilled and unskilled workers. The Knights welcomed all workers, including women, they only barred lawyers, bankers, and liquor dealers. By 1886, the Knights of Labor had over 700,000 members. The Knights saw America's future as a cooperative, producer-centered society that rewarded labor, not capital. But despite their sweeping vision, the Knights focused on practical gains that could be won through the organization of workers into local unions. In Marshall, Texas, for example, in the spring of 1886, one of Jay Gould's rail companies fired a Knights of Labor member for attending a union meeting. Already a wealthy financial speculator, Jay Gould had bought control of the Union Pacific Railroad when the government-sponsored rail company's stock price was depressed during the Panic of 1873. By 1886, Gould personally controlled 15% of America's tracks. When the fired workers' local union walked off the job, others joined. In Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas, and Illinois, nearly 200,000 workers struck against Gould's rail lines. Gould hired strikebreakers, of course, and the Pinkerton Detective Agency, which was a private security contractor, to suppress the strikes and to get the rails moving again. Political leaders helped him and called in state militias to support Gould's companies against their own citizens. The Texas governor deployed the Texas Rangers, workers countered by destroying property, which only won them negative headlines in newspapers under Gould's influence. For many readers of these papers that Gould controlled, the newspaper accounts justified the use of strike breakers and even militiamen. The strike broke, briefly undermining the Knights of Labor, but the organization regrouped and began throwing its support behind a national campaign for an eight-hour workday. Although American President Ulysses S. Grant had issued a national eight-hour law proclamation, and although Congress had mandated a 40-hour work week for federal employees, there were no such standards in private industry. The Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions, known after 1886 as the American Federation of Labor, or the AFL, resolved at its 1884 Chicago Convention 
that eight hours shall constitute a legal day's labor. And they set May 1st, 1886 as the start date of this new American workday. When May Day 1886 came, the Knights of Labor's national leadership actually didn't support this movement of the AFL, but the Knights Chicago leader, Albert Parsons, did. And he marched with his wife, Lucy, and their two children at the head of a parade of about 80,000 people down Michigan Avenue, chanting, eight hour day with no cut in pay. Over the next few days, over 350,000 American workers struck in sympathy at 1,200 firms. Chicago led the nation with 70,000 of these strikers. On May 3rd, a group of strike supporters began harassing strike breakers at the McCormick plant, once again in Chicago. The company called the police who arrived and opened fire. Four people were killed and many more were wounded. The following morning, a protest was planned at Haymarket Square, which was attended by a couple thousand workers. Police arrived at 1030 and ordered the speaker to stop talking and the crowd to leave. A homemade bomb was thrown toward the police and exploded, killing one policeman and wounding six. The police then, of course, opened fire once again on the crowd, killing four people and wounding up to 70 protesters. An anonymous police official later told the Chicago Tribune that, quote, a very large number of police were wounded by each other's revolvers. They emptied their revolvers, mostly into each other. The deaths of the Chicago policemen sparked outrage across America and sensational accounts of the Haymarket Riot, as it began to be called, helped many Americans to associate unionism with radicalism and even with anarchism. Eight Chicago anarchists were arrested and although no direct evidence was ever found implicating them in the bombing, they were charged and found guilty of conspiracy. Four were hanged, and one committed suicide before he could be executed. The Knights and other unions denied and repudiated violent tactics, and some suspected the Pinkertons were responsible for the bomb, since the Pinkerton agency was well known for planting its agents in unions to stir up trouble. Membership in the Knights had peaked earlier in the year, but then fell rapidly after Haymarket, as the group became associated with violence and radicalism. The national movement for an eight-hour day collapsed. Though it had supported the eight-hour day movement in 1884, the newly renamed American Federation of Labor, the AFL, repositioned itself as the conservative alternative to the Knights of Labor. An alliance of craft unions comprising skilled workers, the AFL rejected the Knights expansive vision of a producerist society and economy, and it advocated what it called pure and simple trade unionism, a program that aimed for practical gains, such as higher wages, shorter hours, and safer conditions. The AFL also advocated a less aggressive approach, and it tried to avoid strikes. But the workers continued to strike. In 1892, the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers struck at one of Andrew Carnegie's steel mills in Homestead, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh. After suffering repeated wage cuts, even though protective tariffs were guaranteeing Carnegie Steel's profits, workers shut down the plant and occupied the mill. The plant's operator, Henry Clay Frick, called in hundreds of Pinkerton detectives, but the steel workers fought back. The Pinkertons tried to land by river on the Monongahela River on barges provided by Frick, but they were met by the striking steelworkers. After several hours of pitched battle, the Pinkertons surrendered. They were forced to run a bloody gauntlet of workers on their way off of the mill grounds. But the Pennsylvania governor called in the state militia, broke the strike, and reopened the mill. The Union was essentially destroyed in the aftermath. Despite repeated failure, workers continued to strike industrial corporations. In 1894, 
4,000 workers in Pullman rail sleeper car factories in Chicago struck when George Pullman cut their wages by a quarter, but kept the rents and utilities in his company town constant. The American Railway Union, the ARU, led by Eugene V. Debs, launched a sympathy boycott in which the ARU refused to handle any Pullman cars on any rail line anywhere in the country. 250,000 railroad workers joined the boycott and disrupted rail transportation in 27 states. Although 30 people were killed in riots and sabotage damaged property worth $80 million, the governor of Illinois sympathized with the workers and refused to call in the state militia. It didn't matter. In July, President Grover Cleveland dispatched thousands of American soldiers to break the strike, and a federal court issued a preemptive injunction against Debs and the union's leadership. Debs was arrested and imprisoned, and the strike evaporated without its leadership. Jail radicalized Debs, proving to him that political leaders and judges were merely tools of capital in its struggle against labor. But it wasn't just Debs. The final two decades of the 19th century saw over 20,000 strikes and lockouts in the United States. However, workers weren't the only ones struggling to stay afloat in modern America. American farmers also lashed out against the inequalities of the Gilded Age and denounced political corruption for enabling economic theft. We'll talk about them soon, but before we go, some questions for you to think about. How did social Darwinism misunderstand and misrepresent Darwin's theory of evolution? Why did business find the movement for a mandatory eight-hour day so disruptive and distasteful? And finally, why were strikers and protesters willing to keep fighting when police and state militias and even federal troops regularly opened fire on them?